There's a term that has been floating about for the last 25 years that you may have heard or read about that is of critical significance to hunting and fishing and to the future of wildlife on this continent. It's called the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation. Hi, I'm Shane Mahoney. If you are a career biologist like I am and have studied conservation and wildlife management as a profession, you will have heard this term. If you belong to one or several of today's hunter conservationist organizations, you may have some knowledge of this model. Still, far too few North Americans know or understand the great conservation system we developed on this continent. Lately, however, this system is becoming a more common subject for discussion and debate, and that is a good thing. Simply put, to those of us who would enjoy the outdoors and nature, who actively hunt and fish or enjoy wildlife engagement in other ways, the North American model is the very basis of our shared opportunity. You may not know this system by name, but it is the reason why today we have these opportunities to hunt and fish and pursue our passions afield. Today we are going to explore just what this North American model is, its seven guiding principles, and what these mean to the present and future of hunting and fishing. One of the most crucial of these seven principles can be appropriately described as opportunity for all, a very American way of seeing the world. The North American model of wildlife conservation is next on Boone and Crockett Country. Boone and Crockett Country, presented by Leupold, America's Optics Authority. The access to native wildlife and unspoiled wild places that citizens of the United States and Canada enjoy is the envy of the world. Here, any citizen, for the cost of a license can disappear into the wilderness on a week-long elk hunt, hang a tree stand on state lands, sit in a duck blind on a federal wildlife refuge, or float a river from the headwaters to the mouth. That in this day and age we still have the freedom to hunt and fish, and have guaranteed access to productive places to do so is somewhat remarkable. How did we get so lucky? The answer lies within a grand design based on seven principles known as the North American model. The North American model of wildlife conservation is ingenious and unique in its simplicity and is based on the fundamental idea that all citizens can lay equal claim to a nation's wildlife and wildland resources. Public ownership of wildlife is an ancient concept dating back to Roman times. But this idea was reinterpreted on European soil, where only noblemen were the public and owned all the lands and the wildlife on them. Here, the common man often had no access to these resources. Killing a deer was considered theft, and the consequences were severe. Such exclusivity was what many considered tyranny, and ultimately led to a mass exodus from Europe to the New World and the freedom to prosper through self-reliance, including the right to fish and hunt. With a country of their own, America's lawmakers established public ownership of wildlife as law. Titled the Public Trust Doctrine, this principle is the very foundation of the North American wildlife conservation model. It would ultimately expand to link funding of wildlife management to consumptive users, principally hunters and anglers. Early in American history, it became clear that the responsibilities guaranteed by the public trust doctrine were too great for the citizens alone to properly manage. Left to their own devices, the public would come to decimate many species of wildlife. This experience made it clear that if the public ownership of wildlife was to be protected, laws would be required to safeguard wildlife for the common good.
Much of the early destruction of North American wildlife was the result of its commercial sale, which went against the very grain of the public trust doctrine itself. The doctrine was being misinterpreted and abused, and the government would have to step in to set limits on the scope of what it meant for the public to own wildlife. It was critical to establish that the taking of wildlife was to be for personal use, including to feed one's own family, and to put an end to the sale of dead wildlife in whole or in parts for profit. Can you imagine what would happen if people were allowed to shoot deer and sell those deer on the open market? It would be disastrous for our deer herds. We know this because there was a time when there was an entire industry built upon shooting game for commercial meat markets. The story of what happened to the buffalo was also happening to the elk, deer, and moose in this country. For this reason, the Boone and Crockett Club's early efforts were focused on awakening the people to the plight of their wildlife and raising awareness that these resources were not in unlimited supply. The club's efforts led to the first conservation laws, beginning with the passing of the Lacey Acts of 1900, proposed by club member Senator John F. Lacey. This law banned the interstate shipment of wild birds and mammals and their products, which effectively dropped the hammer on commercial market hunting. The Lacey Act firmly established the second pillar of the North American model, the prohibition of commerce of dead wildlife, a prohibition that proved incredibly effective in safeguarding and restoring North America's fast disappearing wildlife abundance. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Wild Sheep Foundation, putting and keeping sheep on the mountain, and the Dallas Safari Club, promoting conservation and ethical hunting worldwide. With the passing of the Lacey Act in 1900, the groundwork had been laid for further regulations to ensure the sustainability of wildlife. But who should develop these laws? And how would they be enforced? These questions would give rise to the third pillar of the North American model, the democratic rule of law, which ensures that laws developed by the people and enforced by government agencies will regulate the proper use of wildlife resources. Wildlife is too important and too fragile to be managed by special interest or popular opinion or conjecture. This is how we lost some species to extinction and nearly lost others. A system of conservation without laws would be worthless. The Boone and Crockett Club played an integral role in proposing pro-wildlife legislation. The club helped establish government agencies that would be tasked with the enforcement and proper execution of these laws. Further, the club's fair chase statement became the cornerstone for many of the hunting laws and policies adopted by the state and provincial agencies. In Europe and much of the world, hunting and fishing opportunities were often reserved for royalty, landowners, and the well-to-do. And in some regions, this is still the case. Conversely, here in North America, a hunting or fishing license is often all that is required for any citizen to participate in outdoor recreation. Opportunity for all is the fourth and incredibly important pillar of the model, ensuring the right of legal access to hunting and angling opportunities for every citizen. This is one of the incredible achievements of the North American model. The very people who use the resource, hunters and anglers, have continuously supported it financially and otherwise. Access is the key. If we're going to ask people to pay to protect and conserve wildlife, then those same people should have the ability to use those resources in a respectful way. The alternative is out of sight, out of mind. The North American model works because the consumptive public user has a vested interest in the health and future of wildlife. Nevertheless, despite its obvious success, this idea has had its fair share of naysayers. 
From the beginnings of the conservation movement, entirely preservationist or non-use proposals have suggested that the best way to ensure a future for wildlife is to essentially separate them from man. But Theodore Roosevelt and his fellow members in the Boone and Crockett Club believed strongly in wise use conservation and fought aggressively against such measures. Boone and Crockett lobbied for laws and institutions that provided this funding, including taxes on sporting goods and ammunition under the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937 and the passing of the Migratory Bird Hunting Stamp Act of 1934. And now, a closer look with Doug Painter, presented by Leupold, America's Optics Authority. The critical relationship between habitat and the wildlife it supports is the cornerstone of the science of wildlife management. Over the years, management programs have helped to restore many native species to healthy and abundant numbers. But even the best science cannot succeed without adequate funding. For many decades, sportsmen have been at the forefront of wildlife conservation funding through license fees and excise taxes. This user pay system provides some $500 million each year to conservation efforts. Over the past 75 years, excise taxes from the Pittman-Robertson Act alone have pumped almost $7 billion into wildlife restoration and improvement projects, including critical habitat for threatened and endangered species. Beyond these direct contributions to conservation, hunting and hunters make a significant contribution to the U.S. economy. Each year, hunting generates some $21 billion in economic activity throughout the country that translates into close to $5 billion in federal tax revenue. Today, as we are challenged to meet the funding needs of our society, the continuing contributions hunters make to our natural resources should not go unnoticed. As a hunter, you should be aware and proud of the role you play in helping all Americans enjoy our wildlife and wild places. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Pope and Young Club for the Good of Bow Hunting and the Guide Outfitter Association of British Columbia. Wildlife stewardship is our priority. The first four pillars of the North American model all point to the ideal that game animals should be hunted and taken responsibly and respectfully and for legitimate purpose, and that strict guidelines should be in place regulating this take and prohibiting casual killing. Non-frivolous use, as the fifth pillar of the model, did not exist in commercial market hunting culture. As this activity faded and was replaced by recreational fear chase hunting, an ethical personal code of conduct emerged. While many individual hunters were advocating for this principle, Boone and Crockett Club members Theodore Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and George Bird Grinnell were instrumental in framing and gaining acceptance for the original concepts of hunting ethics and wise use without waste. Theodore Roosevelt once said, conservation means development as much as it does protection. I recognize the right and duty of this generation to develop and use the natural resources of our land, but I do not recognize the right to waste them or to rob by wasteful use the generations that come after us. Within the North American model, the states and provinces set their own quotas and regulations regarding the pursuit and take of wildlife. But the sixth pillar of the North American model stipulates that because wildlife and fish freely migrate across boundaries between states, provinces, and countries, they are to be considered an international resource. Wildlife does not pay any attention to lines on a map, especially migratory species like waterfowl. When we talk about conservation and management, it has to be in the context of the largest landscape or that system simply will not work. In the early 1900s, the waterfowl populations in North America 
were in such a state of decline that they were in danger of being lost. The Boone and Crockett Club, most noted for its work with big game species, also recognized the need to preserve crucial nesting habitat for waterfowl and rallied to establish the National Wildlife Refuge System in 1903. However, international treaties were necessary to protect birds that migrated across the borders of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Club members and sportsmen also pushed forward the passing of the Migratory Bird Act of 1913 and 1917 and the Migratory Bird Convention Act of 1929. Now the recovery and future prosperity of migratory waterfowl was underway and secured. Boone and Crockett Country has been brought to you by Leupold, America's Optics Authority, and the Boone and Crockett Club, fair chase and conservation since 1887. Within the framework of the first designs that would become the North American model of wildlife conservation, science was interwoven and trumped casual opinion and special interests when it came to decisions affecting wildlife and wild lands. Science enabled the exploration of space. It also enabled the rescue and conservation of the wild others who share this continent and the world with us. Boone and Crockett Club founder Theodore Roosevelt firmly believed that only the best science available was to be used to make critical decisions on natural resource management and contributed club funds for some of North America's first wildlife research projects. Consistent with Roosevelt's early policy, known as the Roosevelt Doctrine, today science anchors the North American model as the final pillar, that wildlife is to be managed by trained professionals using the best science available. These aren't widgets that we're talking about. Wildlife are complex living and breathing things that depend upon their habitats and each other. Therefore, we must use science when making critical decisions. Since the Boone and Crockett Club began laying the groundwork for the North American model of wildlife conservation over a hundred years ago, the seven pillars have emerged as the most successful foundation for public land wildlife management in the world. The North American model has certainly stood the test of time, but will this model remain relevant in the face of burgeoning urban populations, decreasing habitats, and fewer people participating in outdoor recreation? Today, the model faces increasingly complex challenges. There needs to be an organized effort to assess and resolve these challenges. The consequences of inaction could include serious weakening of the foundation of wildlife conservation in North America and the resulting decline of wildlife habitats, populations, and hunting and fishing opportunities. There is a myth concerning wildlife, a myth that many find attractive, perhaps because it is easy to understand and perhaps because it expresses how, in a perfect world, we would like things to be. This myth often expressed by those who oppose hunting, but also by members of the more general public, is that wildlife exists by accident. Stated in various ways, this myth suggests that all we have to do is take man out of the equation and perhaps set aside some protected areas, eliminate our use of wildlife, and let the natural system thrive on its own. Unfortunately, while this may have been true in the past, it is certainly no longer true today. For wildlife on this continent or anywhere else in the world. The fate of all wildlife species now depends directly upon the decisions that human society will make. Whether we are discussing energy development, high seas fishing, or the protection of large and potentially dangerous carnivores, only by making the right decisions can we hope to keep the wild creatures with us. This will take careful thought, dedication to purpose, and guiding principles upon which we can all agree. Doing so will require us searching for examples of our successes and the reasons for our failures in the past. 
In all these regards, the North American model of wildlife conservation stands as a guiding light, purposeful and no accident, guided by specific principles and implemented by both Canada and the United States, focused on both the future of wildlife and the preservation of our sustainable use of this resource, and spectacularly successful in recovering species and building populations under science-guided harvest and habitat management programs. The model is no myth, no accident, no fluke. For over 100 years, it has proven its worth. Hunters and anglers who have done so much to make this model the success it has been, now need to rally to its cause, study its history, partake in its prideful achievement, and ensure its future. Wildlife conservation has been no accident, and neither has your opportunity to hunt and fish. Believe me, both can be lost so easily. Thanks for watching. I'm Shane Mahoney.